And if you guys could uh, join me in prayer before I open the word, I would appreciate that. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege to open your word, knowing that it never returns back void. Looking at your truth and then encouraging your people to apply it to their lives, that they would be benefited by that reality, God. And we just ask that you would work in all of our hearts today as we look at your truth and what our relationship with you should look like. So I ask that as you do that, uh, Holy Spirit, you would work in such a way that we could uh, all leave encouraged and reflect on the beauty that is available to us through our relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus. So, I, uh, not to be overly dramatic, I'll just say, I'm standing up here, and I feel like this is like, the content of this message is not the hardest message I've ever had to share, but how I feel right now, and wanting to share anything, makes this the hardest message I've had to share. I'm hoping that uh, some of you are newer to the house, so don't have as much context for some things, I guess, um, which is okay. But I'll just say that um, my heart's heavy, and I'm asking that uh, you guys extend grace to me in that, and uh, I guess um, I'm confident that God will profit us from this time. Uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful that you can hear a word from the Bible from a guy named Joe. And you could just remove my title from, from me today. I don't really need to be identified as a pastor. I know that I am, but uh, just trying to be real and connect with you guys in that. Um, I think maybe at times, especially if we haven't prepared messages and we haven't had to do what Pastor Ryan and I do often or others, then um, it's hard to connect with maybe the process that people walk through to do that. I know Ryan's done a really good job of conveying, like, some people don't understand they have practice on Thursday for worship, and there's things that lead up to it. It just doesn't just happen, right? Um, and I think the same is true with, with the Word and how we prepare to release that. And um, at times it would be easier if we were robots and we could just do jobs, right? But uh, anyway, so my, my message today, saying all that, is I'm hoping that, you know, what is that? It's attached to the camera. It says ACME sound deflector. Um, okay. I didn't notice that. I thought it was interesting. Mm -hmm. Anyways, <laughs> so abide in me. Uh, the, the message that I put together today uh, there's a, a few reasons why I did it, and what I was sharing in terms of how my heart feels right now uh, happened after I, this was all done and stuff, so I still have the same assignment, and I'm trying to be obedient to that. Uh, I feel like God deposited things in me as we've been leading. Uh, there's six of us right now in the discipleship group, the uh, Blue Year Journey group, and so there's been things God's been depositing into me. Uh, in that, and ironically, the content we went through, it's, it's kind of how the Bible works. Um, Journey Group is, we're reading the Bible, and there's other things that the, the, the creator of the, you know, the pastor that created it uh, has in there that's beyond the Bible. Obviously, it's a good study and stuff. Um, but I've gone through that core first six weeks already with the group the previous year in the green year. And it's like when we read the Bible, we can read the same passages, the same verses, and get something completely different out of it. Because the Bible is active and living, sharper than a double-edged sword. And so it's like a book, like no other. And uh, inside of this, I'll just say I feel like God's given me fresh things out of it. Uh, some of the men are the same. Brandon was in both years with me. Um, and uh, But there's new things coming out of it. So I think if we just... Uh, and I, and I was talking with another pastor about this recently. If we, if we stay in the present moment and we let we share what God's teaching us right now mm -hmm. and what we're doing, it's a powerful testimony. Mm -hmm. um, I'll even, just as an encouragement, joy with our conversation last week, uh, just hearing what was taking place around your, your home there. Super encouraged by that, you know? And 
And that's what we're meant to be. We're, we're meant to abide in our relationship with Jesus, be his hands and feet, and share what God's doing in our lives now with others, as Jake was saying, you know, uh, that's a part of the disciple-making process, where people can understand our walk with Jesus, and we can help them with, with their walk with Jesus. But anyhow, so this blue year in the journey group is a part of why I wanted to share what I have today. Um, also, some uh, reflecting on some conversations that I have, I'm one of the five people on our executive team for the fellowship of all of the churches that are connected, and things that span back to last fall um, that created a theme that we have for the whole fellowship this year. We have our own theme, the year of greater access for this church specific, but I'll talk about, for those that might not remember what we've said about that before, I felt like God was saying, remind us of what we're all supposed to be doing soon. Um, in only a few days, a lot of the men are going with me and, and Pastor Ryan to Men's Advancement, one of our annual corporate times that our churches come together. And so we're going to hear more about that there for those that go, but I want you all to be able to connect with part of what we're going to experience there, even before we do. Uh, also, just kind of uh, seeing where our ministry is at in the timeline since our existence. Um, back to two, April 2015, when we got the word of God. And then, you know, May of 2015, we go to Apostle Phil, and he affirms, and then everything else from there happens. And eventually, April 3rd of 2016, our first service exists across the street. Um, but looking at today, April 14th, 2024, where I believe we are as a ministry, um, and reflecting on the five families that planted the church with us and just what God has done in that, I really feel like uh, what I have to share is helpful in the, in the present moment for us now. So uh, my question that I want you to answer inside of yourself, but you don't need to like out loud answer it today, is this. Do you feel you truly have an abiding relationship with Jesus Christ? Yeah. Again, just to repeat it, do you feel you truly have an abiding relationship with Christ today? So I want to, I want to open the Word of God. Uh, J- John chapter 15, I'm going to read verse 1 to 17, and I don't know that I have the yeah, right there, but uh, just so you guys can go to John 15, 1 to 17. And we'll, we'll hit certain parts of this. I'll come back to it again. I'll look at it in the translations. But I just want to read the whole thing. I'm going to be reading out of the uh, New Living Translation, but you can read along whatever version you have. If you need a Bible, feel free to put it in hand, and one of the uh, ushers can get one for you. Can you say that one more time, Jeff? John 15, ch- uh, chapter 15, verse 1 to 17. Okay. Thank you for saying that, Evan. If you're here and you're ever not hearing something, please do stop us. It won't be out of order. Just, you know, we're family. Speak up and let's, let's just be real with each other. So, yeah. So, let's read John 15, 1 to 17. Jesus, the true vine. I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And he prunes the branches that do, not, that, that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. Hallelujah. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch that withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Verse 9, I have loved you even as a father has, as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in his love. 
I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow, just as we were even singing about earlier. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves, but because a master does, doesn't confide in his slaves, now you are my friends, since I have told you everything the Father told me. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. As we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Verse 17, this is my command. Love each other. So letting that be a backdrop for what I have to share, I will say, we'll see, never uh, a guarantee, don't quote me on this, but this message might be shorter than typical. And if so, perhaps we'll get time to fellowship and even pray together at the end even more, with more flexibility. But anyway, my first point today is this. If we truly desire to live a fruitful life, we must centrally value an abiding relationship with God and fellowship with Him and His people. So, while there's a number of words on the screen, the keys to pull off that, a fruitful life, do you want one? I hope you do. I do. Um... But what's central, I believe the heart of God is to have an abiding relationship, to, to stay close and remain in that fixed position with our God. And two ways that he wants to see that manifest is, is yes with him, but also in proper fellowship with his people. And so as a church, as any church really, but our church definitely, since we are all here with one another today, we have an opportunity to to uh, celebrate, grow, focus on, care about, and uphold uh, the importance of fellowship with one another. Another way to look at abiding is to remain stable or fixed. I did some, you know, kind of searches on what, you know, how could we understand that a bit differently, but better. Um, Looking further, you know, at at remain, at the word remain, it, it could be stated to dwell be present, and to be held and kept. Uh, Those sources, as you would look them up, I mean, they could be wildly different. Um, There are, in particular examples, uh, abide is used and defined at first, in the first sense, to remain against stable or in a fixed state. In the phrase abide in me, Jesus is asking his followers to stay constant in their relationship to him. Constant. Um, if you're married, you know, I would uh, hope that your spouse would desire that with you to remain stable in a fixed position of love towards them, no matter what is taking place. Uh, and Jesus wants the same with us. That's what he wants. Um, you can see you can see it reference in Acts 2.42, uh, but uh, the early Christians continuously devoted themselves to fellowship. The church began that way. Uh, Jesus is encouraging us in that. Because what he began, he's still continuing in and through his people today until he comes back. And he doesn't want it to change. He hasn't changed. He doesn't change. The word teaches us that God does not change. The world will change, but he will not. And so we're meant to reflect that reality in our relationship with him, in our relationship with one another. (coughs) Again, early Christians continuously devoted themselves to fellowship. And sometimes it can be hard. Like We had a a small group last night, and the prize was very kind of opening their home, and the Shelley's in leading it, and... uh, you know, sometimes it was like, you know, lots of little kids, I'm sure all sorts of stuff for us last minute, but like you just kind of get there and they show up and they're like, go through what took place last night. And, and sometimes it's just, you know, it's like, 
you get through a thing, and maybe it doesn't even look completely like what you expected, but there's good in it, and we praise God for those opportunities to be in fellowship with one another. Fellowship, and this is where the, 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 uh, my heart and mind went back to the fall, where our fellowship, where our executive team was talking, uh, the word koinonia is what our focus is within the fellowship. But there was a theme for the all of our churches in 2024, even though, again, we have our own theme uh, for this church in particular, uh, koinonia. So, you know, it's, it's a word for fellowship, uh, which means to have, have something in common, something to share. Uh, those who are united with Christ... Uh, we are meant to share our life in Christ with one another in a way that results in individual and corporate spiritual growth. Again, exactly what you're getting at at the second one. Um, share your, your life with your coworker as he goes through challenges and encourage him in who your God is that has not changed and who his God is. And uh, so, you know, in, in, in that, uh, I think... At times, in, the, in that word, to have something in common or something to share. Sometimes it's hard, like if you're in a relationship with certain people, it's like, why well, don't really have much in common with them? Like, what they're interested in, what they do, or whatever. It's like, you know, like, and we've got a pretty diverse group of people within this church, so it would be easy for that to cross different people's minds in different situations. But, but if, if you love God, and they do, and you love the same God, you have the most important thing in common that you need to have in common, right? And uh, he's the God who's for you and who's for them, and so you can be for one another. Simply put, uh, we can't produce a truly fruitful life in God's sight apart from him. That's what that passage was telling us. Apart from God, we cannot do this. You know, some people, I guess, are pretty good at just connecting with people and they're better at it than others and all that, but uh, the reality, the depth of uh, true relational connection that happens between two human beings is the work of God in and through those relationships in that person's life. Even the person, if we could put one person on a pedestal that is phenomenal, everybody would agree that this person's great at connecting with anybody. Um, Give God the glory. Give God the credit for that. It's not just because they went to the right school, learned a couple things, read a couple books, or whatever. You know, it's the gifts and who we are, how we've been created. God has given to us. God has created us. He is our creator. We are the created, right? But I think in this world, in modern culture, especially in America, it's easy for us to take credit for things that are meant to be given to Him. So, uh, you know, looking at the origin in the Greek uh, with koinonia, um, basically for our fellowship of churches, it's a prophetic declaration over our churches late last year into this year that um, Apostle Jamie, who's leaving and taking over from Apostle Phil and leading our executive team, Encouraged, we prayed into it and stood in agreement with this, but there's a significant opportunity, and I believe that men will hear it as advancement. There's a significant opportunity for the church to deepen its relationships. And, and it's it's not just Little Purpose Church, I mean, we are saying that, but it's the church which has to begin here because this is this is our launch point. Like this is where we're identifying in, in our fellowship and relationship with other believers currently, right? So um, there's a significant opportunity for us to deepen these relationships and fellowship with God and with one another. And I think if we pour our hearts into the consistency of our deepening of our relationship with our God, it will be so much easier to deepen our relationship with others, right? And that's, that's where we need to posture ourselves. We are in a, we've always been in the spiritual war. That's nothing new to the church. And if you don't realize that you are, you are in a spiritual war. Mm -hmm. The devil is on the proud to kill, still and destroy. He's got no new moves, but that's his move, and he works with it. And so he looks for his people to agree with him. But we must reject that. So looking at... Uh, here's a, like a 
transliterated form of the Greek, but lo looking at the translation, I want to say, of the Greek word koinonia. Basically, it's referring to concepts such as fellowship, joint participation, partnership, to share which one has in anything. Okay, so you can fill in a blank with anything you have, it's sharing with other people. A gift jointly contributed, a collection, a contribution. Last night, again, at your home was a perfect example of what we were doing. Just everybody bringing food, what do you have to share? And we, it was a beautiful example of three, three small families doing it, right? And uh, God, God is applauding that and saying, continue in this. And so we should. And it's not, I'm not plugging, like, if you're not in the home group getting one, but it's, it's, it's just, let's, let's deepen our relationship with God. Let's look for opportunities to have genuine fellowship with people and, uh, and, and praise God for that and, and be excited to try to grow in that. I have a, an application I want to share as it relates to this point. So, um, my wife's over in kids' ministry, so she can't be here to kind of add her thoughts on this. But on our behalf, I'll just say so, uh, even if it sounds crazy or far to certain people uh, here, you know, our shared gift is hospitality, and uh, we, we love doing that. And last year, that kind of got derailed significantly when we took Joanna into our home. And, uh, you know, we have to make a choice of, you know, are we going to keep it together? Are we going to fall apart? Are we going to be unwise and just not, uh, you know, as an elder in the church, it's one of four, if I can't keep my own house together, you know, what am I doing right? You know, so anyway, some of the decisions we made were like, hey, we're going to not do a lot of the connecting things that we used to do for a season, and we couldn't define it because we didn't know uh, how hard it would be. And I praise God the last week or so, not really this application, but just to share it as an encouragement. You know, Joanne is doing some really cool, amazing things. She's really, like, literally, and I, I guess I didn't really identify it last night with you guys, but like she literally starts saying her first words. She's standing up. She's crawling, like pretty much all in the last week. Um, so, uh, and I, I know it was really cool for Jen that Mama was her first word, and uh, you know I just saw her just like smile, and, you know, because <laughs> yeah. But she, she needs things like that. She needs moments to encourage her. So um, anyway, back to my application. So. You know, we like to be hospitable. We like to be generous with people. We like to open our home. We like to share with people. But it was a lot harder to do with the uh, child with special needs, and you bring them in. And some of you in this house can relate and understand what that is, and, and uh, maybe others not as, not as much. But um, we're trying to regenerate what we used to do slowly now, and uh, even some of you that sit here know this. We've contacted you about pizza parties and different things like that. And, you know, we're stepping out into these things again and um, going to try to increase that. But, you know, we'll just try to make sure that, again, I have to balance, like, what we want to do with what is wise and what our family can actually handle and manage. Mm -hmm. And so there's a tension inside of that, but that doesn't change what's within the heart of the person. Um, so I would just encourage, I share that with you to share that um, for Jen and I, it's been hard for us to completely do what we want to do, <coughs> but God sees our heart and knows, knows what that is. And so I encourage us all to just pray and ask God what role we individually or as a family should play in the body life at Live With Purpose Church to bring about greater point in you. And... Um, yeah, just ask Holy Spirit to speak to you about that. I don't know what that what that means. Again, uh, I found a, a few couple things what that looks like. I think some of the stuff that's taking place with the pickleball stuff could be an example. Where you're like, oh, I didn't I really, I didn't really sign up for that. Maybe, maybe you should. Or you did, and you're thinking you weren't going to come. Maybe you should just come anyway because you said you were, right? I don't know. I had fun. I mean, I didn't smack me all around the wind, but, you know, <laughs> did what I could, you know? Uh, but, huh? The women's fitness group. The women's fitness group, yeah. So there's lots of opportunities. And it, and it doesn't have to be things that you slap the church logo on. I mean, yeah, like, we make them available because we want you to participate, right? You know, uh, 
We actually literally make them available so you have the opportunity to participate. That's why we do it. We don't do it because it's like, well, you know, church got to have certain tests. Let's do it. Let's put about 18 of these things in play and then let, let you just know that they're there. They're literally for your growth and for your benefit. That doesn't mean you have to do them all and we, don't, we want you to not be overwhelmed and stuff like that, but just pray about you as a person. It could be things like what Jake was describing in a work setting as an individual. It could be something, just to kind of pick on you guys now, as a couple that you guys would decide. I don't know what that would mean. Um, but yeah, so your family, you have kids, how you get them involved, all that. A couple scriptures, I want to go back to the main passage that we had. So still John 15, but verse 4 and 5, and I want to read, go a little bit more old school, go back to King James. And then I want to come back to the New Living Translation. But again, verse 4 and 5. John 15, 4 and 5. And there you go. On the screen. So, King James says this. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit, fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. And then bring it forward, maybe it's a little bit more modern way to say it. New Living Translation, verse 4. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Lots of connections in this greater passage and certainly right here. But we, we, we can be fruitful, we're meant to be fruitful, which is basically saying bringing about the will of God in your life. Bringing about beautiful things in the world. When you live and move in agreement with what God wants for your life. But to do that, we need to stay connected to the source. We can't do it on our own and come back and be like, hey God, what do you think? We need to stay connected to the source. We need to recognize when we are victorious and doing great things and feeling like life is going really well, that we need God as much right then as we did when things are hard. So it doesn't become our universe and our greatness on display in our, in our thinking and us giving a contribution to ourselves for all the great many things that are in our life. When we're struggling, being real and just bearing yourself to the Lord and saying, I want to know what you say. I want to be reminded of who you say I am. And I want to respond in that. If my heart needs to be repentant, I want to be soft to that. If I need to put my face on the floor before you and have you speak to me, I want you to speak to me if that's what I need to do. Because I should, because the Word of God teaches that God esteems, God actually esteems or holds up high those who are humble and contrite in spirit to Him. That's a person... And I'm not saying if you have gifts that you should just try to never take a compliment and act like you're capable of nothing or whatnot, but the capabilities you have within you is because he placed them there. Mm -hmm. And he helps you identify them and exercise them and benefit the world because you have them. That's the reality. So we would be good to attribute it to him. Again, we said Acts 2.42, so even though I referenced it earlier, if you want to look at Acts 2.42, we can go there. This really shows us the posture of our hearts that God desires for us. I want to read it this time out of the Amplified, but again, you can look in your translation. And we'll see a similar thing. Verse, verse 42 in Acts chapter 2. It says, They were continually and faithfully devoting themselves to the instruction of the apostles and to fellowship, to eating meals together, and to prayers. 
That's exactly what happened again last night with Fry's home. And Elder Joe did a good job leading us. If we could all come together and pray. And we did. And so it doesn't need to be some big, amazing thing, because that's amazing in and of itself. And, and that's, when I look at that, and what I, why I wanted to read the Amplified Version was, they are, in, in your translation might say something similar to this, but continually and faithfully devoting, there's two key words, continually and faithfully devoting themselves to these things. So, um, at times, no is okay, Jesus went to the other side of the lake. He, there was moments when he tried to get away from the crowd. He went and prayed and blood dripped from his head before uh, the, the beginning of the end, so to speak, would take place in his life. Like He had moments where he knew what he needed to do, and he needed to get just with him and his Heavenly Father. And we have those, we have those moments. We have those things that we need to do as well. But, but I believe the Spirit of the Lord is encouraging us to continually and faithfully devote ourselves to these things, not to, not to uh, deny the opportunities that are, are there, and not to do our part in the process of trying to continually and faithfully devote ourselves to these things. Continuing on, a um, couple more quick points I want to make. So, we walk in power when we stake our lives on God's words as absolutely true and walk them out in life. So, what am I actually trying to say there? We walk in power. Do you want to walk in power? I want to walk in power. I believe I do walk in power. And I want to continue to walk in power. And I want you to walk in power. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean just like powerful strides down the street. I mean, I guess it could in one way. But what it means... I believe is when you when you stick your life in God's words. So you say, okay, in the B-I-B-L-E, I'm going to open this thing up. I'm going to read it. I'm going to keep digesting it. I'm going to take it in. And I'm going to apply it to my life. I'm not just reading it to read it. I'm reading it to know it and to apply it and to live out of it. And I want my whole life to launch from that. And if that's the posture of your heart, then you walk in power. The Spirit of the Lord is reminding us of this. We walk in power when we'll actually take the word and apply it to our lives. We will be obedient to the very words of God. So, if we stake our life on God's words, saying they are absolutely true, it doesn't matter what the world tells me, it matters what He says, because what He says does not change, and what I believe He has said is true. And if it's truth, and we know that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth, then I want to walk in truth. I, I hope you're sitting there and you're saying, yeah, I, I want to walk in truth, I don't want to walk in lies and believe in all the jacked up notions of the world. So if we believe, for anybody that's sitting here today, and you believe, yeah, I believe the Bible is actually completely true. It's, it's absolute truth. And I know a lot of people struggle with absolute truth, but if you're sitting there and you're like, I actually believe that that's true, then you can walk in power as you walk that out in your life. When you say, you don't need to get cute. Just do what the Bible says. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you might read a thing, and you're like, I don't know how to apply that completely. Well, then get, get with somebody. Get with a brother and sister. Get with Pastor Ryan. Let's let's look at it and see. I don't understand that. Um, I don't remember David if it was you, but somebody in our group brought up something like, "What is that?" I feel like you might have done that in the last group. Yeah, and we're like, "Okay, let's look, look let's look at this, right?" And so that's regardless if it was you or somebody else in our group, somebody did it, and you know that's what needs to happen. Um, we need to be able to speak up. I mean, Evan asked me what scripture I said again, so he can make sure he had the clear scripture. In, in our lives, if, you're, if you don't understand how to apply it, God will work to bring that about so you can understand it for yourself. But you, if you want to walk in power, then you have to start believing what the king's saying, and you need to live that way. And in one way, you know, you're like, that's oh, really hard because, like, I want to do what me, myself, and I said. So I do get the tension, like, it can be hard because I want to do what I want to do. I mean, I have moments where I just want to do what I want to do. But then if you just say, no, I'm going to do what he wants me to do. That's just going to be my posture. It gets really simple, actually. God's not, God, while well, God's mysterious, God speaks plainly to his people. And he's given a word for us for a reason, because he wants us to know him. And so that's what he wants. And I, and I believe if you, again, say, I'm going to stake my life. Like, the Bible is true. 
I don't care if uh, what the world says around me. I'm going to live based upon that. Uh, the Shelleys, you know, your daughter, and uh, I wanted to. I uh, so at some point, hopefully, get, lay my hands on her and speak words over. But like, you know, dealing with some hard stuff relationally in the school system, and just like, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna process the Bible together. I'm gonna do it here. I'm gonna let other people attack me. And, I'm still going to, like, stand up for my guy. She's walking in power. Yeah. Right? There's no junior Holy Spirit. There's no time where you're now. It's like, only the people who are sitting here right now, we, we better get on with it because the kids need us. It's like, well, yeah, they do at some level. But, no, any of us that have the Spirit of the Lord inside of us, the Holy Spirit, we can walk in power. But to do that, we have to actually believe what God's saying is true and then just, like, shut up and get out of the way and just do what he says. Right? Keep real simple. Um, and when we, when we can do that and just say that that's first and foremost, any time where I feel like I've gotten out of order, out of stride with my God, just humble yourself. Get on your face and say, get me back on that path again. Get me back on that path. And he will. He is faithful. Amen? If you abandon truth as Jesus describes it, again, it's, it's his truth. It's not our truth. It's his truth. What possible substitute could replace it? The answer is human reason, the number one competitor of truth. We all have discernment and reason, maybe in varied levels, but we have it. And sometimes, because the devil's real wily and slippery, we can be living out of human reason and not out of God's truth and think the opposite is actually happening. Our human reason becomes dangerous when it determines that God's thoughts, his eternal truth, aren't as important as our own pursuit of temporary happiness, situational convenience, or momentary pleasure. True freedom is having the power to act in harmony with the truth, God's truth. The freedom that Jesus promised to us is freedom from our fallen selves. And the power to live according to his word. So what I'm saying there is not some magical formula that only a few people can do. Like, I'm never going to dunk a basketball. Right? Even back in the day when I was young and I could jump higher. Never jammed a 10-foot basketball. Didn't do it. But I tried. So there are some physical things we have limitations to. Right? And that's okay. But there's no limit to any of our ability to do this. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the ability to walk in power and live in agreement with your God is available. It's what Jesus died for. And and we worship him and we come together in his name and we pray in his name. And so we, we, we need to be reminded of this. I said this last week when I was MC and I I guess I want to I didn't mean to, because <laughs> I was going to say it again today, but I, you know, what, I, I just released what God had for me that day. Other people encouraged me. It was great and whatever, but I just want to say it again today, an application. So in Malachi 3, and I guess some of you probably won't even hear last week, so, you know, it'll be fresh for a couple of people. Um, Malachi 3 is what? It's, it's the one place in the Bible where God says, test me. You know, I'm hoping that catches your attention. He says, test me. The creator of all things says, test me. Who the heck are we to test him, right? But he's saying we can. So, we can do just that, right? And it's in the area of finances. And my message isn't on finances, but finances is one thing. We can't serve both God and money. So, so as I've done this, as I've trusted Jehovah Jireh to provide, he has in mysterious and amazing ways, I've just con- continued to see my ability to walk in power as I just stood in agreement with this. Not that I could just test God, that's a part of it, but I'm, I'm wanting to view finance the way he does. I'm wanting to steward it the way I believe he wants me to steward it. And in that, he's allowed me and enabled me to walk in power. I've staken my life on the hopes that he's provided in his word. Meaning the process he's taking me through, I trust him. I don't fully exactly know the entire process, and I don't need to. 
<coughs> because when you trust somebody, you trust them. And I trust Jesus. So with that, again, we can't serve both uh, God and money, but for me, when we look at you can walk in power, you fill in the blank, but I think at times, why does the Bible tell us we can't serve both God and money? Because money can get a big grip on a person. Money can define how you live your life for real, for real. And in many people's lives, it does. What we won't do, what we can't do, what God could not pull off, because I'm fearful that he will not provide. His moments when we serve money, not God. He gives us discernment. He gives us wisdom. Put food on your table for your kids. Do the basic things, yes. But there are... There are stories in the Word of God that show people's lives. I didn't write this down, but just thinking of some of them. You know, it's like, yeah, your your last meal. We're getting ready to meet my kid. We're going to die. Man of God steps in. The prophet steps in. Yeah, like, uh, make me a meal, lady. God says so. Would you do that? Would I do that? I don't know. Yeah, like, Joshua's hungry. And then we're going to die. I'm going to give my boy the last meal I got. And this gunslinger, man of God, Christian guy comes in here and tells me he wants my food. All I got are the widow and her mites, giving everything that she had, making the rich people in that moment <coughs> look pretty silly in God's sight, and bringing him glory. The woman with the alabaster jar that just... Breaks it open and pours it on the feet of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and says, You know, I'm a being obedient to God. I'm walking in power. I'm pouring in power. You can tweak that to whatever you need to. And the disciples are like, What the heck is this woman doing? This is crazy. And Jesus is rebuking them. What she's doing is beautiful. I'm not going to always be with you people. And for those who know the word, you know that I'm preaching what's in there. I didn't cite the stories, but there's more countless stories. Why are they in the Bible? They're in the Bible because this is who God is, and this is reflective of his relationship and what he wants. We just have to trust God. It's not always easy, but when we do, it is powerful. And I want us all to walk in power. Two verses. John 14. 14, 6. Jesus himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. I love verses like that. There's other ones that are shorter. Jesus wept. Especially ones that Jesus says. I don't need no red letters to get my attention. But when Jesus is talking, I hope I'm listening. I hope you're listening. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. He's talking about that abiding relationship. You can't earn it. You can't do anything. There's still some broken down car Christians out there today still trying to earn it. Decades later. You don't have to earn it. He found you. He came for you. He paid it all. He didn't leave some change and miss the bill. You know, He's got a couple back dude payments he's got to make for you. He paid the whole stinking thing. So, he, he wants us to know him and remember what he said. And he offended the Pharisees many times. The, the supposed esteemed religious leaders of the day kiboshed these guys, got them all twisted, because he called them out. They didn't like it. Was Jesus a madman in those moments, operating out of order, being a crazy man? Or was he speaking truth? And he was modeling walking in power because he was the word, speaking the word to a people that didn't want to embrace the word. But he's the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but for him. Which is awesome. Because you just have to believe that Jesus is who he said he is. Give your life to him. 
deepen your relationship with him. He don't care what you messed up yesterday, today. He says, I love you. You can't blow that. You can't lose that. I love you. And then we go a little bit further in the same chapter, verse 12 and 14. I'm going to go off of Amplified that, but look at your translation. John 14, 12 and 14. I assure you and most solemnly, solemnly say to you, anyone who believes in me as Savior, pause, anyone, that's everyone, anyone who believes in me as Savior will also do the things that I do. And he will do even greater things than these. Pause. Love how amplifies it says this. What? In extent and outreach. Because I'm going to the Father. Jesus knew he had to leave. And he was making a runway for us to go out and kick butt and take names for him today. Until he comes back. And he didn't even know when he's coming back. And he even told them that. Only the Father knew. And he knew he was coming back. He just didn't know when. But he was being obedient to the Father. Walking in power. Verse 13, and I will do whatever you ask in my name as my representative. You've given your life to Christ. You are his representative. This I will, will do so that my father, there's a purpose in, in saying this, so that my father may be glorified and celebrated in the son for what Jesus did. Verse 14, if, I ask, if you ask, sorry, if you ask me anything, in my name, in the name of Jesus, as my representative, I will do it. So it's clearly saying, you're know, asking anything in my name as my representative. Clearly baked into that thing is in God's will. It doesn't mean vending machine, punch it in, you know, with some, like I'm thinking of like the Penguins of Madagascar, like cheesy dibbles or whatever, I think popped out of the vending machine with like, the guy ran with the what was it, octopus man or whatever. <laughs> like, but picture, like it's the vending machine, things coming out. I want this, you know, B3, give me that little crunchy thing or whatever. <laughs> it's like, no, it's like God saying, I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a vending machine. But if you ask anything in a, my will, in agreement with me, and you live based upon that, I'll do it. You don't need to know how I'm going to do it. I'll do it. I might not even do it when you want me to do it, how you want me to do it, in the way in which you thought I was going to do it, but I'll just do it. And if we trust him, if we trust him, for real, for real, we walk in power when we stake our lives on God's words as absolutely true, nothing but that, and then we just say, I'm going to walk them out. It's all I got. That's my one move. Just going to do what Jesus chose me to do. Right? All right, let's land the plane. Last point. God is love and he desires hey look here we're done 11 30 people God is love and he desires our love to drive us to love others well and contend for oneness of purpose with others do you believe that do you believe God is love I do I believe that the love of Christ should compel us to love others well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's very hard. It's very hard. It's hard for us all to always be in agreement. But we should. What's our part in that? Even in difficult times or seasons. To contend for oneness and purpose with others. I believe sometimes to do that we have to say things that will be hard and unpopular and uh, even find ourselves confused and lost at times. But we go to God and we ask him, are we, are we doing this, God? Are we contending for oneness and purpose with other people? And if we are, he gives us the courage to continue on in our journey and to walk that out and to not be discouraged by what you experience because as I tell my kids all the time what what is true is never false and what is false is never true and we stake our lives on God's word is absolutely true it'll never be false and if we walk it out meaning we live a life based upon God's word the steps we take or the steps we're meant to take. And it doesn't necessarily matter 
if everyone is in agreement with those things. But in those times, it can break your heart. And it can make you ask, am I contending for oneness of purpose with others? And so, but I believe we are, because God is love. The love of Jesus inside of us should compel us to love others well, to contend for oneness with people. I believe that God wants to remind us of that today. And back to the title of the sermon, you know, Abide in Me. The statement Jesus made, Abide in My Love, yeah, it was a command given directly to his 12 disciples, but it, it clearly applies to every believer. Right? So you, you can't take yourself off the hook with that. It wasn't just something from back in yesteryear. And, uh, you know, no matter what translation you're in, it, it's still true. Jesus repeated the phrase twice. Verse 9, verse 10, back to back. I would hope if, we, if he was standing here right now, and he said it to us. We wouldn't need to hear him twice. We just hear him once. Be like, good enough for me. But I believe he did it for a purpose. And I believe that the divine authors of the Bible, inspired by his spirit, have things recorded the way they do because there's things that we're not meant to miss. You can read the scripture and miss it. So sometimes we're probably well suited to just slow down and read small little chunks. Nothing wrong with you if you guys are reading chapters a day of the Bible. Eat it as much as you can. Take it in, right? But really diving deep on smaller nuggets and marinating on that thing for a while, it's kind of like a crock pot, man. You ever had some? I've had some doozy meals out of a crock pot. You're like, what the heck is going on in there? It's kind of things, think of things in there a long time. And God worked in a great way with it. Time produced that. Us spending time with his word and with him. Enough time where we can shut up and slow down and listen. Uh, he can do great things with that. He can profit us. So, again, Jesus said it twice. You know, abide, in, abide in my love. And then they get, you know, saying it so that I think he wants us to really not miss it, right? And... You can continue to be connected with Jesus and learn from him, and I think we should be. Um, and we should allow his love to compel us to love others in increasing fashion. So, uh, just because you get older doesn't mean that you're, you should be done learning and you shouldn't be teachable. Um, myself included. So... If we want to let the love of Christ compel us to love others increasingly well, I believe we have to be teachable. Because as he's going to show us, even if he would be like, you know, Ernie, you're really loving people well, brother. Keep going. But if you're saying, but I want to, I want to increase in this ability, God. I, got, I, can, I can show you a thing or two. I feel like Jesus would say that to you. And he'd help you grow in that, right? And he's going, oh, well, Poor Grace, I put her to sleep. But, you know, she's here. Thought, well, actually, got even younger, so. But, uh, yeah, take somebody younger. It's like, same thing. I want to grow in that. Doesn't matter. Age is. Age is. You hear me? You hear me? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. I just close my eyes and listen to what the Holy Spirit said. Amen. She got your mouth on. But my point is, that none of us get out of this one. It's, it's you know, if the love of Christ in us. Puts things like that in our heart where we want to grow in, in a thing, and then we turn to him and we ask him to help us. He will. Period. One last scripture for you. Philippians 2 2. Apostles talking to people at that time, but certainly the Bible's for us, at least. Talking to us too. Make my make my joy complete by being of the same mind, having the same love towards one another. Excuse me. Uh, knit together in spirit, intent on one purpose, and living a life that reflects your faith and spreads the gospel, the good news regarding salvation through faith in Christ. We're 
We can make God very happy when we strive to be of the same mind. We won't always be, but, but if our heart wants us to be, and we ask God to help us to try to be part of that process, and how do we love one another towards that aim? How can we stay close with one another and connected? How can we remain intent on one purpose? The, the purposes of God. How, how can the purposes of God be, I keep going back to this, how can the purposes of God be what I stake my life on? Right? That's what I, I'm hoping you guys take from today, that we, we want that to be true. And then we live a life that really reflects our faith. When people ask what a person stood for and talk about you, if Jesus didn't come back yet and you're done breathing here, or even if you're alive and they're just talking about you, I hope that your life reflects your faith. Even if it's not popular, even if it's not well received, but your life reflects your faith. Why? It goes back to the beginning of that verse. It makes it's a part of God's joy being made complete in us. At the end of our life, well done, good and faithful servant. I believe we all would want to hear that from our God. That's the baton passing moment from here to there in terms of earth to heaven. And it's a visual for us. But I believe we're meant to, 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 to hear that, us living a life that reflects our faith and spreads the gospel, the good news that Jesus began spreading while he was here, needs to be evident. It be easy for us to just let other people try to do that job, be like, I used to do that. Spent some time doing that. Did that world got a little bit crazier? I just kind of hunkered down, buried my money out back, and whatever. You know, there's some probably some strange stuff going down on the southern end, and even back in 2000 when we had Y2K, it was probably the same same stuff type of stuff then. I didn't live here, but I feel like we're not meant to be the light that's hidden. We're meant to be the light that shines brightly, and uh, again. Young and old, we're doing it. Uh, but just continue in it. Uh, Self-evaluate. Reflect today and say, is my life living, am I living a life that's actually reflecting my faith? Or if it isn't, or isn't in the magnitude that I want, God, can you help grow me in that? Can you help me take a next step in that? His answer will be yes. He looks at your heart. And uh, he wants to help you. So I'm going to offer to pray for us. Um, if you guys uh, have kids here, don't forget them, obviously. <laughs> if you need prayer for anything, I'm willing to pray with you. So just come on up. If your answer to the original question, do you feel like you truly have an abiding relationship with Christ today? is no. Or even if it is yes, but as we were just saying at the end, you're like, I just feel like my life isn't really fully reflecting my faith the way I want it to be. Can you pray with me? But two more gathered together in agreement. He is present. And so I'm glad to pray with you for that or for anything else. Um, when I'm done praying, if you don't need prayer, but you just want to hang out and really love on one another, God would celebrate that. And uh, if you got to go, we understand too, but let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for each person who is here. Thank you that your supernatural work in us, in, in our earthen vessels, our bodies that are your temple, Holy Spirit, can be used to re represent your kingdom, to love one another well, despite differences. And I know that you know everything that's going on in each of our lives. We talked about how your ways are higher, God. And we know that they are. 
But even with this small number of people that's here today, relative to the billions in the world, your ability to know every thought and every need that we all have simultaneously, omnipresent, omnipotent, right here in this moment, to be able to do that is evidence that your ways are higher than ours. And yet you do the same thing across the entire planet in this moment. So we look to you, and we thank you. We thank you that you are a God who walks with us, God Emmanuel. We're thankful for your, your many names in Scripture that show us the many facets of the beauty of the relationship that you make available to us. And it is one that's meant to deepen over the span of the lives that you give us here on this earth. And so I pray for each of us, God, through the work of your Holy Spirit, that we would have a greater hunger, a greater desire, a greater drive to be in greater fellowship with you and with others. And we all, we are a body. Some are the fingernail, the pinky. Some are the nose. We all have different parts to play. But you want us to work in a beautiful harmony together. That's what you want. And that's what I want, God, too. I want what you want. For each of us, for our lives, for our relationships together, for the future before us. And I believe that this word was spoken over our churches in 2024 for a reason. So I ask that there would be a supernatural amplification to a koinonia effect across all of our lives, our fellowship with one another. I pray that there would be a hunger where the good works that would abound out of the steps taken in obedience as we stake our lives on your truth, God, that you would be so glorified and, and great things would come from that that we could only attempt to take inventory of, not even actually see them all. But the ones that we don't miss, but the ones that we do see, that we could praise you for those things, God. For the beauty that comes from that. The beauty you bring from ashes. The beauty you, for, you bring from any situation. We praise you for that. I pray that each person can leave encouraged, God. I pray that the needs that are here... Lord, that, uh, yeah, you would help us to personally receive what you want us to, to know today. Tomorrow is not guaranteed for any of us, even though it would be easy for us to believe it, it is. But while we're here today, may we make the most of it that you begin. <coughs> I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.